This week on the show, we're going to be showing you how to set up RAID raids in both FreeBSD and OpenBSD. There's also an interview with David Chisnow, one of the FreeBSD core team, about the switch to Clang and, of course, a lot more. As usual, we're going to be telling you about all the latest news and answering your emails, so sit back and enjoy some BSD Now, the place to be, SD. Now, episode 36, Let's Get Raid, recorded May 7th, 2014. Hey, I'm your host, Chris Moore. And I'm Alan Jude. Hey, we're glad to have you guys with us this week on the eve of BSD Can coming up next week. Already looking forward to that a lot. Yes. Signed up for some Dev Summit sessions. So, yeah, this is going to be fun. Yeah, I got I got into the last one uh, this morning. Uh, most of the other oh, ones I've been in since when they announced it w- weeks and weeks ago, but there was one of them. I couldn't decide between two, and I got the reminder email. Like yesterday, I was like, you better yep. sign up. I'm like, all right, all right. You do that now. Yeah. yeah, I got a couple of mine in this last week, too. So, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. It should be fun. We hope we see you guys out yeah. there. If uh, when do you, when do you to... get in? Man, I have to, like, look up plane flights. I think, let's see, the Dev Summit starts Wednesday. Wednesday. So, you... so I come in Tuesday. Right. Uh, well, then make sure the you check out the uh, the goat boff. Oh, okay. Yeah, so there's a birds of a feather session Tuesday night about goats. <laughs> About goats, yeah. Okay. Sure, yeah. <laughs> if you watch the thread on Twitter, it's pretty interesting. I'll have to. Okay, I'll have to, to throw a, I'll throw a link in the show notes about it so that people know what it is. Uh, is this taking place at the pub? Yes, by th- any this chance? takes place Over at copious amounts of beer. Yeah, this <laughs> takes place at the Royal Oak Pub uh, and with copious amounts of drinking and such. Uh, but it should be good fun. Cool. Well, looking forward to it. Yeah, yes. I hope to see any of you guys out there next week. So again, stop by and say hi and. Uh, and we'd love to hear about your experiences at VSD Can. That'd yes. actually be kind of cool to get some other people's experiences. Well, yeah, like on top of recorded on the show too. Right. We, we, we were hoping to get a bunch of interviews while we were there, but it'd be cool to get some, you know, some people that were just there and kind of talk about yeah. how interesting it was. Yeah, user feedback yeah. is good. Uh, so. Maybe on the uh, Saturday after they've mm-hmm. experienced the Friday, they can they can talk to us on Saturday. That would be cool. Yeah. That would be cool. But anyway, enough about the promo for BSD Can yeah. next week. We do have some news to get to too. So uh, first up, we have some OpenBSD starting us off today with uh, 5.5 has been released. Yes. So if you've uh, ordered your CD set, then you've probably already had it for a while. But for everyone else, they've formally announced that the public release of 5.5 is available. Mm-hmm. So this is going to be one of their biggest releases to date. There is a long, long list of changes and improvements. Some of the notable highlights, including the uh, Time T being 64-bit on all platforms. I think Theo gave a talk on that at Malta. Yes, it was uh, last very year. interesting. It's yeah, yeah. So ref- I don't know if the video that's is up now. I don't now, think but they it- ever did. I'm going to slap somebody over there. Oh, that's but, a bummer. Um, it was a great talk. Uh, yeah, it was. But it, it's basically solving the year 2038 problem. Uh, mm-hmm. Basically, you know, in Unix, time is counted with a, a counter and that's a 32-bit counter signed so that means that when you get to you know two billion seconds uh since 1970 then the it'll roll over into a negative number and that would be bad uh yep, yep. so it's it's like you know the real y2k type issue and uh so theo's uh and the people over at openbsd have worked on a way to uh make it 64-bit while still being supported even on 32-bit platforms uh, so mm-hmm. that since a lot of the embedded hardware that things rely on uh, is still 32-bit and it needs to have software that will run on it that won't break when it, we pass the year 2038. Uh, and, you know, he goes on to mention stuff about, um, you know, well, the year 2038 seems far away from right now still. Uh, mm-hmm. But with the development cycle of embedded devices. Embedded like sitting around forever. The controllers that control the valves in oil pipelines Mm-hmm. around where Theo lives. <laughs> yeah. He's very yeah, concerned like about that. They don't exactly go out there and patch them every six months. You know right. what I mean? So, <laughs> like, they tend to get put in and sit for according years. According to the research, it's like they spend like eight years in development and then they get deployed and then they're there for like ever. And so mm-hmm. in order for the fix to actually be available on that stuff, when it takes, there's so much lead time to get it there, means that, you know, this fix has to propagate to more than just OpenBSD uh, pretty soon so that's why they're kind of leading the way on it mm-hmm. yeah, definitely yeah. it's kind of a, a a big change and it kind of breaks some stuff but they had to do it anyway 
Well, you know, better to make the break now and get it done ahead of time, exactly. so they're not no, no scramble. You know, a couple of years beforehand. Yeah. And, oh, and, oh, and we it, got all these embedded platforms; they're going to fail. Yeah, because uh, one of uh, in Theo's talk, he kind of mentioned what he likes doing is like, you know, going down to the local store and buying like a CD player that that keeps track mm-hmm. of the date, and he sets the date to just before 2038 <laughs> and lets it roll over, and then it doesn't work anymore. Nice. <laughs> it's like, nice. well, that that goes to show that you know. I'm not overreacting. Some stuff is actually going to break. Man, I got to buy all new appliances now. All these smart things. Yep. I mean, my refrigerator is going to stop running. I mean, good lord. Exactly. But uh, anyway, yeah, that's so cool. So of course, that's not the only thing that changed. Right. No, they added a, a bunch got, of new hardware support. We got support. release sets and binary packages being signed yep. now. Uh, so a new auto install feature. They have VXLANs, uh, which is a, a cloud feature for creating VLANs between data centers. Or just between mm-hmm. racks or whatever, between networks, basically. It allows you to create VLANs over UDP. It's actually a, nice. a big, interesting feature, very popular with like VMware and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And now there's a completely open source implementation of it uh, on OpenBSD, which is really cool. That is very cool. And then I'm looking here, we got, let's see, RelayD improvements, new PFQ system, uh, DHCPD and DH client fixes. Shoot, I mean, that's a long yep. list. RNG has been replaced with Cha Cha Twenty for crypto. Yeah, I think they. Oh, used, they got uh, Fuse support too. Oh, that's interesting. And then they have also grabbed TempFS, and the, the, mm-hmm. the, you can now make soft RAID partitions that are larger than two terabytes. On RAID Five, okay. Uh, and, and they uh, added RAID, RAID 5, five, which wasn't yeah. available before. Very cool. Yeah. So, of course, we'll have the link to the full change list on their website, and it's huge. So, go ahead and read through it if you want all the nitty gritty. Um, also, if you're doing an upgrade from 5.4 instead of a fresh install, pay careful attention to the upgrade guide since there's going to be some specific steps you right. need to take uh, because to uh, properly. Yeah, everything changes because of the change mm-hmm. to the way they track time. Uh, so yeah. it breaks everything. <laughs> yes, yes. So some very specific instructions yeah. so you don't end up uh, hosing your OpenBSD box. Let's see here. There's also some errata patches on your new installation, especially those open SSL ones, which we are all familiar with. Yeah. So um, you'll need to get those on top of the system as soon as you install it. And let's see. The project's now going to send them out signed, so your errata patches will be signed. That's a good deal. So we want to, of course, offer our congrats to the whole OpenBSD team. This is a great release. Yes, and, of and course, we're see, looking uh, forward to 5.6 when that hits, too. Yeah, I just uh, pulled up the art uh, from the CD set. It's uh, mm-hmm. very fancy. They do a good job with this stuff. Uh, it's like uh, in when you open the jewel case, it's got like uh, a time machine type, you know, where you set the date where you want to travel to. And mm-hmm. the time it's got one of those and it's set to January 2038. Uh, you know, right the one second before uh, everything will break. <laughs> yep. Yeah. It's uh, cool stuff. Good deal. All right, so next up in the news, we have some FreeBSD Foundation funding highlights. Yes. So what happened with that? Uh, so that's their spring fundraising campaign, and they're going. They're highlighting the stuff that they've already done now. Uh, mm-hmm. So they're talking about the new UEFI boot support that is now actually in head. Uh, so that's a project they've been working on for a while, and it's up and available for people to use now. Sure. Okay. It's just, uh, showing people the results of uh, all the money they donated and how that's actually becoming... Mm-hmm. usable now. How that's being used. Yes. So, pull quote from this, as we embark on our 15th year of serving the FreeBSD project and community, we're proud of what we've done to help FreeBSD become more innovative, reliable, and a high-performance operating system. So, yep. that's pretty cool. Let's see. So, they go into a lot of detail, of course, on what the UEFI is and why we need it going forward. Yeah. It's also, like, they this mentioned is what some it of the, is and why oh. you should care. <laughs> yes, yes. They also mentioned some of its uh, some of the new work they're doing for console to support UTF-8 and wide characters. Yeah. So that's going to be neat. Uh, I know that's, and, uh, that's especially big in like the Russian community and, and other mm-hmm. and Japanese and anywhere that yeah. is non-Latin characters. Definitely. Yeah, that's something that we've needed for a while. So I'm glad to see that's making progress. And of course, we hope that they continue to uh, publish these uh, series articles so we can see what other work's being sponsored in the future. Yep. Uh, well, there's always a list on their website of what's being sponsored, but this kind of goes into more detail than just saying, we're yeah. working on a new console. It's like, this is why you need a new console. Yes, this is why a new console, this is what will change and what it'll, what it'll do to everyone else and, out there. And these articles are always more exciting because it's, this is done. You can have this now. Mm-hmm. We're not just working on it. You can actually play with this now. Sure. Which is always good cool. stuff. 
So next up in the list, we got some information here about OpenSSH without OpenSSL. So this is cool. The OpenSSH team has been hard at work making it even better, and now OpenSSL is completely optional. Since it won't have access to the primitives that OpenSSL uses, there's going to be a trade-off of features versus security. But uh, this version looks like it's going to drop support for legacy SSH v1, and the only two algorithms cryptographically wise are going to be uh, supported in-house implementations of AES and counter mode, and then the new combination of the ChaCha20 stream cipher with Poly1305 for packet integrity. Yeah, which so, I'm sure this makes all the crypto guys excited. And I always forget what the what the names stand for. Yeah, uh, well, we did an episode on that a little while ago. We, yeah, we did, I'm uh, still confused which ones are which. Yeah. Uh, but basically, they uh, you can now make uh, open SSH with the option open SSL equals no, and it won't mm -hmm. use open SSL at all. Uh, the downside is that you lose all the stuff that comes with open SSL, which is sure. uh, support for RSA, DSA, and ECDSA public keys. Uh, you'll only mm -hmm. be able to do the new ED25519. Uh, but basically, if you just drop all the legacy stuff and use only the brand newest stuff in OpenSSH, all of that is implemented out in OpenSSH itself, not with uh, pulled in from OpenSSH or OpenSSL. Mm -hmm. That's hard to say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it means that you can now actually have uh, a version of OpenSSH that will work completely without relying on OpenSSL at all. I wonder what prompted them to uh, want to do such a thing, right? Well, it just, it mostly <laughs> it didn't take very long to say, just disconnect all this other stuff. Sure. But sure. Uh, they said, interesting enough, though, this was planned before all the Heartbleed yes, news hit. Exactly. So, uh, it's just an option people wanted. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there are some downsides, obviously. Uh, some clients only support like RSA or DSA or something. And so you sure. can't have an EDD or ED25519 key on older clients. But uh, mm -hmm. In most cases, it's something you could do, and and uh, I don't expect to see this as the default uh, on you know on the portable version, sure. but yeah. uh, it's definitely an interesting option, especially yeah, uh, as a short term fix until uh, LibreSSL is available uh, mm -hmm. outside of uh, OpenBSD. Of course, we'd love to see this hit the FreeBSD ports tree and NetBSD's package source. That would uh, be cool. So, so yeah, if it's plug in the portable there. version, I imagine. Yeah, it'll just be an extra option in the port just tree show up. where yep. it'll just, uh, you'll actually have the option to turn OpenSSL off. Normally, with most apps in the port tree, you optionally turn it on, and this one you'll be able to turn it off. That'll be interesting. Uh, it apparently cool. also includes a new buffer API uh, and a set of wrappers hmm. that make it compatible with the existing API. I'll have to look into that because uh, yeah. we do a bit of tuning with that for sending very large data, set, data sets across the internet. Mm-hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. Well, very cool. So uh, next up in the news, we want to mention BSD Magazine's April 2014 issue is now out. So we'll have a link to where you can uh, find that. That's the uh, free monthly BSD mag that's available for download as a uh, PDF. So if you'd like to read that on your uh, tablets or other devices, it is now available. Um, this time the articles include Pascal on BSD, an introduction to revision control systems and configuration management, deploying NetBSD on AWS EC2, some more GIMP tutorials, and an Asia BSDCon 2014 report and a piece on how easily uh, credit cards are stolen online. So a little bit of everything for uh, a wider audience this yep. time around. So, of course, uh, anybody can contribute to the magazine, too, we want to mention. Um, just send the editors an email about what you want to write about. And uh, I've done a number of them, so yep. it's really not that painful. You just open up an Office document and sit and type and send it over to them. They'll edit it, suggest any changes, maybe move any pictures around that you have, and you give them the go-ahead, and that's it. It shows up in the, in the magazine. So pretty painless to do. And uh, I guess no Linux articles in it this time <laughs> yes, around. So, was, hey, so plus one. The last two months, it was like, <laughs> why is there Ubuntu stuff in my magazine? Sure, sure. So that's uh, cool. Yep. So that's our uh, weekly news. But of course, we want to mention this week's sponsor, the iXSystems.com monster. Yes. Great guys over there that will build everything from free NAS boxes to big servers, mini, and everything in between. So uh, what they've been up to this week, though, Alan? Yep. Got uh, any other they got their recap recaps? from, uh, they were at uh, Linux Fest Northwest uh, with me, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a picture of uh, the other guys from Jupyter Broadcasting doing a show. Uh, Actually, cool. uh, interviewing another BSD person, uh, Michael Dexter. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, then here's me with uh, Ben at the iX Systems booth, uh, showing off PCBSD and FreeNAS to people. Nice. And, uh, a lot of people were very interested to walk up and look at PCBSD and be like, this looks like my desktop. This is mm -hmm. BSD? 
Like what? BSD can do that? Yeah. Like when did that happen? It's like, well, <laughs> it's always been able to do that. PCBSD yep. just makes it easy. <laughs> sure. Uh, and they talk about some of the interesting stuff and then uh, like the giveaway. And uh, Ben also gave a talk there about setting up your first free NAS. Mm-hmm. And uh, they have video of that. So there's, you can see his 45 minute talk on uh, setting up your first NAS with free NAS. If you haven't uh, really played with free NAS, it's a very good overview of, of the steps you take the first time you want to set it up. Sure. And then they have a bunch more pictures. Uh, as with mm-hmm. every time they go to the conference, they go around and take pictures of everything and you can see the cool stuff people are doing. And they, uh, there's a really good display with uh, 3D printers at Linux Fest. It was quite interesting. Oh, that's neat. Yeah, I always enjoy seeing those. So they also have a, uh, they posted something on the FreeNAS forums. It yes. looks like they're looking for adventurous types mm-hmm. to become beta testers for FreeNAS. And they've set up a new mailing list for communication about that. Yep. So um, we'll have a link to that in the show notes, of course. Take a look, see how you can get involved making free NAS even better for future releases. Yeah, get the inside but, uh, yeah, track of course. on what's going on there. Yeah, yeah, definitely, and be involved in the development process. Mm-hmm. That's definitely a good way to get your feet wet in the open source world. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, as usual, we want to mention a couple of the other cool things that they're doing, and the website, of course, is ixsystems.com slash BSD now. Go ahead and uh, hit that site, put in your information. They'll, it'll give you a free link to a, a download on a, a guide for building servers for open source, what you want to know from your vendor and what you want to ask, how to talk to your management about it, and kind of sell them on the idea of a, a getting a vendor that understands open source and how important that is. Yep. And, of course, when they're building the systems, they can build everything from the small free NAS minis that go under the desk to the monster 80-core systems or the, the one with how many terabytes of storage There's was one that, that was like 400 terabytes. Basically, it was yeah, like two you know. pallets full of servers and hard drives. <laughs> <Just> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, so they're obviously yeah. capable of building pretty much anything that you can uh, throw at them. Yeah, so, from, uh, from like a, a little short-depth one you that you can hold in your hand uh, mm-hmm. to a... A, a massive storage array that takes a forklift. Sure. <laughs> what, whatever, so, whatever you need. It's they kind of do the whole scale. And they'll make sure they build it to your specifications. Yes. And it's not going to just put something in a box and say that well, should and, be good enough uh, for you, know, you. I, I just, you know. I just bought another one. And so they email you. You're like, mm-hmm. so uh, we're get, we're it's almost finished. Uh, do you want us to install some stuff on it for you? Is, is, are there any bio settings you'd like us to make? And they, they give you this yeah. worksheet and you fill it out and you be like. Yeah, I want it all set up with like these IP addresses over here and, and you know, set this password mm-hmm. on that and, and do all this. And then so, you know, when it gets delivered, it can just be installed in rack and it's good to go. Right. And yep. It's up and running, which works great uh, for me, especially, you know, this time the machine's going to my house. But in other sure. times I've shipped it directly to a data center. So having mm-hmm. it pre-configured uh, meant that I didn't have to you pay have to $100 an tech. hour <laughs> and be on the phone with the tech explaining what to do to get it set up. It was mm-hmm. ready to go. Uh, plus the burn-in test, right? The, the, they test, yep. they run the machine for days and make sure it's going to work. You know, uh, we've seen from studies from Backblaze and Google and other places that hard drives fail in the first 24 hours of being powered mm-hmm. on. So, you know, the fact that they run it for three days ensures that if, they, if there's a bad hard drive, they found it already and replaced it before they even ship it to you. Sure. Everything's going to work. And that, that just, it's, it's hard to describe how much money that's worth just knowing mm-hmm. that it's going to work. Uh, and they actually offer five-year warranties now as well. Wow, very cool. And, of course, they build these with all the latest and greatest Intel processors, and yep. they make sure that the brand-new stuff, the bleeding edge that's coming out, works properly yes. with the uh, BSDs. Yep, uh, the little short depth I have at home is the, the mm-hmm. brand-new X10 series of uh, motherboards nice. from Supermicro. They are really nice. Very nice. Yeah. So again, that address, ixsystems.com slash BSD now. Let them know we sent you and uh, we would appreciate that. Yep. We'll be back with our interview in just a moment. So we're joined today by David Chisnell. Thank you so much for being on the show with us. Um, first question we ask everyone, what was your first experience with BSD? How did you get started? What led you into this community? Um, so I first encountered Unix of any kind when I went to university and I was mm-hmm. at Swansea which if you booted a slightly older version of Linux you'll have seen it near the top of the credits for the TCP stack. Sure. This is um, why we got a lot of people applying computer science at Swansea I discovered that <laughs> they'd all seen this thing go off the boot message and it scrolls so fast you don't really read anything other than this word Swansea which gets subliminally imprinted in your brain and associated with geekdom. Um, 
but one of my housemates decided to set up OpenBSD on a router. I said, what, what's this OpenBSD thing? Mm -hmm. He said, well, it's sort of like Linux, but with a different logo. And, and then I found FreeBSD because I tried the OpenBSD installer on my uh, desktop, and it said, warning, if you press yes now, it might destroy everything on your hard drive. Uh. And I only had one hard drive, so that was slightly terrifying. The FreeBSD one did exactly the same thing, but didn't print the warning, so that See? was fine. <laughs> You're just better off not knowing. Um, but I, I started using FreeBSD more seriously a couple of years after that because uh, most of the work I was doing was stuff that needed a Unix system of some kind. And on Linux, I could not make sound work. You had, back then, this would be about 2002, 2003, you had slash dev slash DSP, which was probably also by now, mm -hmm. um, but it did OSS emulation. But the OSS emulation didn't do mixing, so if you wanted to rewrite your applications to use ALSA, then they would do mixing if you had um, hardware mixing, but I was a cheapskate, so I didn't. Um, if you wanted to do software mixing, then you could use the KDE sound daemon, which is great, and you send it some sound, and a few seconds later it goes bing, because <laughs> it was well known for its low latency mixing, um, except that Obviously, all the KD applications were rewritten to use this, sure. and they all went bing. Um, but and so my uh, the instant messaging client I was using at the time could successfully go bing, and that was great. Except mm -hmm. that I was using Evolution for mail, and Evolution sure. was a GNOME application, and so it talked to the GNOME sound daemon, and the GNOME sound daemon and the KDE sound daemon, one of them could use Dev DSP. And then, of course, music was played by XMMS, and it didn't talk to any of these. It just wrote to DevDSP. Um, back then, everyone in the lab wanted to play BZ Flag, and so you want to have the music in the background. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to get the instant messaging thing saying, look as if you're working now. It's very important. <laughs> um, and you wanted to be able to hear the bullets exploding in BZ Flag. So getting four things to talk to the... Um, sound card at once turned out to be a little bit beyond Linux. Mm -hmm. um, and back then there was what FreeBSD 4.4, 4.5, something around that. Uh, and you could explicitly configure multiple dev DSP devices mm. and you could have the default one as whatever the app that you haven't set up was. So BZ flag, no configuration, just worked. XMMS would be talking to Dev DSP one, the GNOME sound daemon to Dev DSP two, the KDE one to Dev DSP three, and so I could have two applications going being at once, mm -hmm. and that w it was slightly depressing that that was a thing that I needed to <laughs> configure explicitly. Uh, but then FreeBSD five beta came out, mm -hmm. and I'd been adminning a room of Linux machines, so I didn't really understand what everyone was talking about when they said this was really unstable by BSD standards, um, because all these machines had NVIDIA graphics cards, and they were running the NVIDIA binary drivers, so if they got three hours of uptime, that was great. Uh, and in comparison to that, 5 beta 2 was really Rock stable. solid. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I stayed on the 5 series, and I um, left the server onto my desk running 4. Dot whatever right up until 4.10 or 11. Mm -hmm. um, but for everything else, I was using 5 and then 6 and now 10. Mm -hmm. uh, and I got involved as a committer because I'd been working on Clang because I wanted Objective-C stuff to be able to compile. And I was writing the code on FreeBSD. And it turned out that FreeBSD is kind of like OS X, it's kind of like Linux, um, but it's not exactly like either from the point of view of a compiler. And other people were working on OS X and were working on um, Linux. And not many people who had commit access to LVM back then were working on FreeBSD. Now there are quite a few more. But uh, um, Roman said, you should you know, upstream this stuff and get involved with our FreeBSD on uh, Clang. FreeBSD, FreeBSD compiled with Clang project. Uh, so I got involved there, and then the foundation paid me to do the port of libc++ to FreeBSD. And then I looked really, really gullible and got elected to the core team. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'm here. Okay.
Oh, sorry, you mentioned the core team. What are your responsibilities there? Um, so the responsibilities of the core team are kind of hard to define. It's mostly your job, I think, is to make sure that the people who should be talking to each other are talking to each mm -hmm. other. Um, so when people say herding cats, that's quite apt. Um, you know, it's not a management role in the same way that it is in a company because you can't say, no, I'm sorry, your work is terrible, you're fired. Mm -hmm. Then people are like, yay, free time again, Yeah, uh, which isn't so much of a disincentive. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is, a lot of it is finding the people who have the common interests and the people who have the problems and the skills and putting the two together so that uh, you know, people who come along to us and say, we really want to build a product based on FreeBSD, but it needs this feature. And we can say, well, we know people who will add features in exchange for money. Sure. And they say, ah, we have money. Mm -hmm. And at the end of it, they have less money, and FreeBSD has more features, and everyone's happy, <laughs> um, possibly, except the people with less money. <laughs> um, well, if it's only temporary, well, they make more money than building yes, the product, yes. right? <laughs> uh, that's at least the goal. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Um, it's you know, partly liaison with vendors, partly it's, we now have, what, 300 and something committers. Mm -hmm. um, if you put 300 humans in a room or near each other, then if they all get along really well, they probably actually aren't humans. <laughs> yes. uh, so you get little personality conflicts, and often it's because most of the communication happens online. Mm -hmm. And you sit down in a room with someone, you chat with them, and they're perfectly reasonable, you're perfectly reasonable. Sure. But one of you wakes up too early in the morning, doesn't have coffee, and sends an email that isn't quite what you meant to write, and then the other person misinterprets it, and they reply, and then you're annoyed by their reply, mm -hmm. and this whole thing escalates. And if it happens on a public mailing list, other people join in to try and correct one or both of you, possibly because now it's a different time zone, and they've just woken up, and it's 7 a.m., and they're grumpy. Um, so this sort of conflict does flare up and someone on the core team has to just sit them both down and say, look, you people, you don't hate each other, really. Mm -hmm. um, you're both very nice people. Just take a break. You were at the last conference smiling and having a good time together. Come on. <laughs> uh, so it's a little bit of that. It's partly trying to set goals for the project. So one of the things that I've been trying to push is, uh, well, two things that are uh, high on my priority list. One is making sure we have a usable base system with no GPL code. Mm -hmm. um, this is kind of important for getting um, various kinds of corporate involvement with the project because um, if you have the GPL as a sort of firewall around the code, people will develop products by saying, this is the GPL bit, this is the proprietary mm -hmm. bit, we'll put in big abstraction layers and we'll make sure that the proprietary bit doesn't touch the GPL bit. And that then means if they do in the future want to upstream their work, because they have these heavyweight abstraction layers, actually you don't want their code. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you have BSD license code, people will say, fine, well, we'll just take it and we'll build a proprietary thing. And then a year later they'll come back and they'll say, you know, we're spending a lot of developer time merging stuff. Mm -hmm it would be much cheaper for us if you put this stuff of ours in your tree and we'll say, oh, we like features, we will have that. Mm -hmm. uh, and very often you know, they'll have maybe five or 10% of the code that they add is the really important stuff for their business. Um, and Netflix is an interesting example because Netflix is basically willing to upstream all of their changes, sure. but we don't want all of them because some of them are you know, really good cases. optimizations mm -hmm. for people who have exactly the workload that Netflix has. Sure. Some of them are making the network stack faster for everyone. Some of them are making the storage stack faster for everyone. Those are great. So Netflix has a few hundred lines of changes that we don't want. Mm -hmm. um, at some point, we may find that we have other users who do need them, and then we'll want to find some way of uh, integrating them all. But by and large, it's trying to make sure that all of the vendors have as small a patch set as possible, so it's easy for them to pull in our code, and that's great for us because it means they test it really early. And one of the traditional things with open source projects is dot zero releases, mm -hmm. don't run them, they're scary. Mm -hmm. uh, but if we have vendors who are going to pull in the code from head, they're going to test it, they're going to push back bug fixes, 
then even if they're not going to ship something based on the dot zero release, we get a lot of testing out of it. Sure. Um, right. Well, like Netflix was running what became 10 six months before it was mm -hmm. released. Yeah, and we got a. If you look at the um, SVN logs for the network stack, um, there were a lot of things fixed because Netflix said, you know, when you've got 30 meg uh, 30 gigabits a second going through this, it doesn't stay up very long. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, one of the classic ones they found was the IPv6 stack mm -hmm. at yeah. the reference counter. And they could push enough traffic in a weekend to flip it where most people would have to run for months to see it actually misbehave. Um, and this is the sort of thing, I mean, Windows NT4 had this same sort of issue where mm -hmm. if the machine stayed up for 47 days, uh, one of the counters would overflow and it would break. Mm -hmm. um, and it took two years of deployment before anyone managed to have a Windows NT box that was up for 47 days. <laughs> um, but when we have people like Netflix who are really pushing the limits mm -hmm. um, for that sort of thing, they can hit something in a day or two where most people who would roll out FreeBSD, maybe they'd hit it after a month or two. Sure. Then. And if they did it in that sort of deployment with lots of machines all in the data center, suddenly two months into the deployment, they all start experiencing random uh, interfaces dropping. Mm -hmm. uh, that would be really disruptive for them. But mm -hmm. having people who will take the code from current, will run it, will fix bugs, will upstream them, uh, that's great. And even if developers individually try and run current, sure. you know, I run it on a couple of VMs on one server, mm -hmm. but I don't push the machines anything like sure. as hard as they will. And a lot of other vendors will do the same sort of burn-in testing with their products and mm -hmm. then spend a bit of time trying to find out if the bugs that they're encountering are in their code or in the FreeBSD code, and if they're sure. in the FreeBSD code, well, they might just put a hacky workaround in to fix it, but we try and encourage them to at least report it upstream mm -hmm. if not fix it themselves. Well, yeah, because uh, one of the kind of issues with the FreeBSD release cycle is all the changes happen in head, and if all the users are running release, by the time the change gets to the users for them to test it, it's been three months and the developers moved on to the next thing. So this is one of the reasons that we're pushing for the continuous integration stuff, and the FreeBSD Foundation's been funding some of that, and Core's been quietly encouraging it. Um, and the idea, longer term, is that every change that goes in will be compiled, tested for all architectures, mm -hmm. we'll spin up Beehive instances, we'll spin up QMU instances for ARM and MIPS and any other platforms. Right. Even longer term, we'll actually net boot on um, various boards. We'll then run a whole set of regression tests, we'll run performance tests, we'll mm -hmm. say, this change to the network stack, really nice, except that on this yeah. workload, 10% slower, not going to make customers happy. Mm -hmm. um, and for an open source project, the notion of the customer is a slightly odd one because sure. you know, we are all the customers. Mm -hmm. The people who we build the system for are the people who are building the system. Mm -hmm. um, but some people have some requirements, some have others. And again, this is something that Core is responsible for trying to coordinate these various people pushing in different directions. Um, and back on the network stack again, um, Recently, we've had interest from Netflix and um, VeriSign, mm -hmm. who have almost exactly opposite workloads. <laughs> so VeriSign, um, you may know, runs um, several of the DNS root domains. And so they have lots of things which are send a UDP packet, get a UDP packet back. Mm -hmm. Or when you're doing IPsec and you're doing the DNS over TCP, you have a little bit of TCP session set up, you send two or three TCP set, well, typically just one packet for the request, maybe three or four packets for the reply, and then TCP session tear down. Mm -hmm. So your actual traffic for the um, payload is maybe half, if you're lucky, of the total number of packets mm -hmm. that you're doing in terms of setup and tear down of the connection. So they really are interested in very, very short-lived connections sure. with very small packets. Um, whereas Netflix is totally at the opposite end of the spectrum mm -hmm. because 
they think a megabyte is a packet, yeah. effectively. I mean, <laughs> it's not a packet on the wire, but it's, yeah. you get a megabyte from disk, you put a megabyte in the packet, in mm. the socket, and then the megabyte goes out over TCP. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and the only thing you ever get back is an hack. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so having a network stack that scales to those extremes, and you know, we have companies like WhatsApp, which are somewhere in the middle, they have very long running connections, sure. but they do very small packets across them because mostly it's instant messaging traffic, which mm -hmm. is just, hello, I'm awake. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and but four million concurrent connections yeah, yeah. per server. Yeah. 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 And so all of these people have very different requirements on the network stack. Mm -hmm. and what you don't want is any one company to be pushing so hard in their direction that they break it for everyone else. Mm -hmm. But you do want them all to be pushing their improvements that benefit sure. everyone else. And so sure, yeah. this kind of coordination is usually something that just sort of happens. Um, and we're very lucky in the FreeBSD project that mostly these guys just play nicely mm -hmm. with each other. Um, but very occasionally you do get the kind of conflict where you need someone to be able to mediate. And sure. that's one of the responsibilities that the core team has. Cool. So what are you doing personally now? Are you involved in any more LLVM work? or? So I'm now uh, at the University of Cambridge mm -hmm. where um, they seem to just pay me to do what I was doing for fun. Um, <laughs> but with it's loads not more resources. Wrong with that. Yeah, so, that's a good um, thing. Yeah, I just don't know why they're doing it. But I'm hoping they won't figure it out either. So mm -hmm. uh, maybe I shouldn't have said that uh. in my <laughs> podcast. Uh, but never mind. Uh, so, as well as you know, the project that I'm working on there builds on FreeBSD mm -hmm. and it builds an LLVM and we've also, uh, I'm not sure when this will go out, but probably we have just open sourced our um, soft core MIPS processor, mm. or if it goes out too quickly, we're just about to open source our yeah. <laughs> soft core MIPS processor. We've been just about to for about three months, but I think now sure. we really are just about to. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is written in a, a high level hardware description language called Blue Spec Systems Verilog, which has various parametric facilities for types and things, mm -hmm. um, and has a very rich type system. So it lets you have something that's very, very flexible, and we can do things like very quickly change the TLB size. Mm -hmm. um, and in Verilog, this would involve a lot of rewiring. In BlueSpec, it's often just you change a single parameter and stuff just falls out. Hmm. Um, so this is great for experimentation. Mm -hmm. And one of the goals of this project um, is to produce a um, complete platform for teaching and, and research. Mm -hmm. So we'll have a complete stack from the CPU, the compiler, the operating system, um, which is all open source, all permissively licensed. So we're using a derivative of the Apache license for the um, soft core itself. Mm -hmm. um, the Apache license says software in a lot of places. So we've almost just done a global replace and said hardware um, in mm -hmm. a few places. But it, it's basically an Apache style license. Mm -hmm. um, so the, anyone can then download the code, can either run it in simulation or can run it on an FPGA. The FPGAs we're using run at about 100 megahertz. Mm -hmm. um, I think the new ones can do 150 to 200, sure. um, depending on exactly which features you enable, because some of the features add more work in individual pipeline stages, and that limits the clock speed. Mm -hmm. uh, but then the whole thing boots FreeBSD. Um, we're slowly moving to being able to build everything using LVM. We're not quite there because the LVM MIP64 backend is still a, has issues. Mm -hmm. um, but I've been working on that, and I've also been working on adding extensions to that um, for the architecture-specific features we have and exposing them in C. So mm -hmm. um, the whole LVM stack is very nice for experimentation because it's really modular. Um, you know, adding a um, an intrinsic function, a built-in function in C that maps to an instruction LVM mm -hmm. um, is maybe a dozen lines of code. Sure. Uh, and much of that is almost automatically generated. You have to describe a pattern, which is when you see this built-in emit this instruction, you have to describe what the instruction is and how mm -hmm. it's encoded. Um, and that's you know, two lines of code, one for the pattern, one for the instruction encoding. 
Um, or maybe if it's not using an existing instruction format, a few more to describe that format. Mm -hmm. um, you just specify the um, LVM intrinsic, which is how it's represented in LVM's intermediate representation, and um, the GCC built-in, which is a sort of legacy term now. It's a clang built-in, but um, originally these were using the LVM GCC um, front end, so they still called GCC built-ins in the um, source code. That's a couple more lines just to say, these are the LVM types, this is the name, this is the name of the GCC mm -hmm. built-in. Then in Clang, it's just one line to say, and these are the C types that correspond to the LVM types. Sure. Um, so all of that is very easy to play with for experimentation. And we've also added some things. So our architecture has fine-grained memory protection, mm -hmm. um, which is usable from user space. So we can do things like say, well, whenever you cast a pointer from a normal pointer to a const pointer, disclaim the right permission to that pointer. Hmm. And so you then can never go from the const pointer back the other way. So that's enforced in hardware um, at the granularity of whatever the object is. Um, we've got some LVM transforms, which will automatically insert bounds checking. All of this kind of thing is relatively easy to um, add to LVM, or if anyone from the funding agency is listening, it's really, really hard to add to LVM. <laughs> <laughs> Worked very hard on that. Yes. <laughs> um, but the whole point of this is that the processor itself is extensible. Um, FreeBSD is very nicely structured and documented, and adding these features to the kernel and to libc has not been that difficult. And Robert's done it, so it's been really easy. Yeah. Um, and extending the compiler and the C language to support these features is also something that's made possible by having this very modular architecture in the compiler. Um, and so we're hoping that other universities, other research groups, other hobbyists um, can take this design and can build on this stuff and mm -hmm. can use it for prototyping things and maybe some of them will make it into real processors that sure. don't run on a $8,000 FPGA at a very mm -hmm. slow speed. Um, but it's a really exciting time because 100 megahertz is really slow, mm -hmm. but it's usable. Sure. Uh, whereas even going back five years, you were looking at a computer that even in the 80s would have been kind of difficult to use sure, sure. Um, as the sort of thing you could simulate on a soft core. And mm -hmm. uh, we're now almost at the stage where you get 200 megahertz and you have four cores. And that's actually a pretty respectable yeah. system. Yeah. You probably wouldn't want to build worlds on it. No. Um, uh, you know, my laptop scales down to 200 megahertz on four cores when you're not using much power anyway. So you can save battery. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's very cool. Yeah. Any other questions? Uh, no, I think so. Anything else you want to tell us about or in the foundation, <laughs> what's the project, what's going on? Or? Um, so the, the other direction that I'm currently trying to drive is um, better ARM support and better mm -hmm. power management because um, a few companies who refuse to let me use their names, which is very annoying talking to their suppliers, um, have come to me and said what they really want for embedded devices is a BSD licensed stack. You know, the whole mm -hmm. thing, compiler, um, operating system, libc, C++ implementation sure. um, that they can just take and use out of the box. Mm -hmm. And so FreeBSD is almost there. Um, we, we're, we're very close to being GPL free in the base system. Sure. Um, we support what, ARM. What are some of the last missing bits that are? Oh, there are just some annoying things like we still ship with GNU grep for default, oh, by okay. default. Um, we have now a BSD license grep and mm -hmm. sort and things, but not all of them are enabled. Um, we still have trough in the base system uh, because we haven't quite flipped the switch to MDoc um, and a lot of things in the tool chain, the bin util stuff. The linker is the last big thing and sure. Lubertang was here um, giving a talk yesterday about Bold, which is a new BSD license linker. There's also MC linker, which is driven by MediaTek and LLD, which is driven by Sony. Mm -hmm. So. Hopefully in the next year, we'll have a choice of three BSD yeah. license linkers to nice. choose from. Um, but that doesn't help us right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but for free BSD 11, I'm hopeful that people may still want some of the GPL stuff, 
but we'll be able to build images that don't have any of it sure. and still have a usable system. And for FreeBSD 12, the default should be no GPL. Nice. Uh, but getting some of the power management stuff in is probably quite important mm -hmm. because everyone cares about power management mm -hmm. now. Right? It's not just you know, your desktop has a fan that's too loud, which is where sure. power management was 10 years ago. Now it's either you have a machine that you carry around in your pocket mm -hmm. and you want the battery to last two days. And you don't want it to literally burn a hole in your pocket. Yes, <laughs> yes. Um, or you have a rack full of machines and your air conditioning <laughs> is Watching costing you. Meter <laughs> <stuff>. <laughs> yeah, you just have a big drum at the top where you pour dollar bills in. Yeah. <laughs> then you get cold air out at the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at, at both extremes. And FreeBSD is traditionally very solid in the server. And mm -hmm. ARM is pushing into the server space now with the 64-bit um, ARM sure. V8 architecture. So that's something that's important for us. Um, and you know, Linux managed to make this transition from server to mobile mm -hmm. on the basis of solid server uh, performance. And FreeBSD hasn't quite made that jump, mm -hmm. um, which is a shame because actually FreeBSD works pretty nicely on ARM and a lot of people are running it on the Raspberry Pi now. Sure. Uh, and that, again, is something that I think is benefiting us because one of the problems with ARM has always been you get a dev board and you port your operating system to the dev, to the dev board, and then it's obsolete. Mm -hmm. And the other 400 people who bought that dev board are kind of happy, but now yeah. they've bought a new dev board. Yeah. Uh, whereas the Raspberry Pi is kind of rubbish hardware. Mm -hmm. um, we've, we've got a, um, an architecture that we call ARMv6 in the FreeBSD tree. And what that means is ARMv7 and the later revision ARM v6 features that are present in the Raspberry Pi. The Raspberry Pi is the only non-ARM v7 chip that we actually care about in that mm -hmm. branch. Um, but they've sold millions of them, sure. and they're not going away, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of sad because it would be really nice if we could just move to ARM v7. Mm -hmm. But it is a board that is so cheap, people sure. will buy them without any specific reason for buying them. Um, and then once they've got them, then, well, there's your ARM reference platform. Mm -hmm. uh, and so having a solid ARM reference platform, I think, is going to be a big deal for the project. Sure. And we can then move on to having you know, something with eight cores and shiny GPUs and whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, but having just something where you can say, here it is, play with it, see if it works. Mm -hmm. um, and even here is an SD card image. You've probably got the board at home. Yeah. Just burn it, flash it, um, boot it, Did see what go. happens. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, this has been just a fascinating interview. We're glad to have you have you come on the show today. Okay. So thank you so much for being here, and uh, we'll be back in just a moment with the rest of the show. Data integrity is a complex, multi-step process. Local backups, offsite backups, and fault tolerance all play key roles in keeping your file safe. The easiest way to keep your data safe from a hard drive failure is going to be by using RAID. Of course, there's different levels of RAID, each with their own different goals and caveats. So the tutorial today, we're going to be showing RAID 1 or mirrored drives. By installing your OS onto a RAID 1 or way, you can withstand a single hard drive dying. The system will even keep running normally after a drive has died, but at that point, you'll probably need to look at replacing the failed drive and uh, rebuilding your array so that if uh, another one dies, you're not left out in the cold. So uh, we're going to be looking at FreeBSD first today and then OpenBSD after, so why don't you take it away, Alan? Uh, so on FreeBSD, you have the two main file systems to choose from, UFS or ZFS. Uh, as of FreeBSD 10.0, uh, Devin Teske and I built a ZFS option into the installer that actually will allow you to create a mirror uh, using the menu interface. Uh, and that's actually backported, so FreeBSD 9.3 will have that as well. Uh, but uh, for this tutorial, uh, we're going to use UFS and show you how to do that. Uh, I looked at making a menu for UFS as well, but it was getting complicated at that point, and uh, maybe in the future we'll see. Uh, but for mm -hmm. now, uh, we'll show you basically the manual steps uh, because it's actually not that hard. Uh, so, you'll kind of start your install like normal. Uh, just start it up. Choose your key bit. Just do now. And from your uh, 
menu here, uh, how would you like to partition the disk? With guided mode, it gives you some menus and you can kind of create the partitions. Uh, with manual mode, uh, it just drops you in the partition editor and you create the partitions. Uh, with the ZFS mode, uh, you just kind of give it a list of hard drives and it erases them entirely and builds a, a nice ZFS array, optionally encrypted. Uh, but with the shell mode, you get dropped in a shell and you're expected to create whatever file system you want, uh, set it up to be rooted in slash MNT, and to create the uh, corresponding FS tab file. And then when you type exit, the install will just use whatever you set up. Uh, PCBSD has a similar option, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. So uh, what we're going to do is create our system. So if we just look at this, we can see we have two disks, ADA0 and ADA1. Those are our two uh, SATA drives in this machine. So uh, we're going to create a GPT partition. So we'll use GPART, which is the uh, GOM uh, partition editor. It's the mm -hmm. file system in, or the uh, disk management system of FreeBSD. So we'll create using the GPT scheme on... Oh, uh, So we'll create on our uh, disk. So now when we do gpart show, uh, we can see that we have ADA0, which has uh, 16 gigs of free space. Okay. So we'll do gpart add, and we'll make a 64 kilobyte freebsd-boot uh, partition, and we'll, call, we'll put a label on that ADA0 boot. Right, so now when we do gpart show, we can see that new partition. We have ADA0 with the first partition being freebsd-boot uh, and a 64K. And if we do show minus L, it shows the label instead of the type. So now we can just add uh, freebsd-ufs. Uh, and this gives us a, a UFS partition on the disk. So now we can see we have the 64 kilobyte boot partition and a 16 gig root partition. Then we just want to install our bootloader. So gpart boot code, and we'll choose, we'll put, install a, a protective MBR. This is basically, uh, so if a, a tool that doesn't understand GPT looks at the first sector of the disk, it sees this mm -hmm. fake master boot record that says, hey, this disk is, is actually formatted, please don't format this. Yep. Uh, since some tools will assume if the disk uh, doesn't have a partition table that it's fake to erase it. And then we'll mm -hmm. install GPT boot, uh, which is actually the boot code for running uh, FreeBSD off a of GPT disk. What did I do wrong there? Oh, forgot the one. There we go. Uh, mm -hmm. And we'll install that to the first partition. And now that's our first disk. So now we just repeat the cool. exact same process uh, for the second disk. You can actually mm -hmm. use that, the gpart backup command, which will actually export the partition table to a file. And then you can actually then use gpart restore to apply the exact same thing to the second drive, but it doesn't save the labels. And uh, so we'll just do it by hand. Okay. So we'll create a GPT partition on disk on ADA1, and then just create the same layout with 64K boot partition, but with the different label. And install the boot code so that if the first disk fails, we can boot off the second one. That's one some people forget sometimes. <laughs> and now when we look, we see we have ADA0 and ADA1 with our two matching uh, sets of partitions. Cool. So now we just need to load uh, the kernel module. So if we load gom underscore mirror, this loads the mirror driver and allows us to create our mirror. So we use the gmirror command and we'll label uh, a provider called boot and we'll use the device's uh, ADA0 boot and ADA1 boot. Right, so that'll create a mirror uh, mm -hmm. called dev slash mirror slash boot uh, using those two uh, label partitions we created. And then we can nice. do the same thing again for root. Uh, with the Gmail command, if you read the man page, you can also uh, specify in the load balancing algorithm. Uh, mm -hmm. Depending on your workload, 
Uh, there's one called load balance where each time there's a read coming in, it decides whichever disk is less busy should service that. Or there's round robin mode where just every other write read goes to every other disk. Of course, writes have to go to both, so there's no balancing there. Uh, but depending on your type of workload, uh, shifting that to the different ones might actually give you better performance. Depending if your workload is mostly you know random uh, reads, then the round robin one works better sometimes. Uh, or if you're doing uh, you know contiguous reads, then maybe one of the other options works better. So it depends on what you're doing. Uh, now that we have that, we can format that partition, mm -hmm. that uh, mirrored partition. So we'll just do new FS on that root, and then we'll mount dev mirror root on slash mnt. Then if we just edit that BS, uh, we have to install the FS tab file, mm -hmm. and we'll just put in there dev mirror root mount as slash it's ufs read write there we go so that now it knows uh, where to get its partition from All right and so now that we're done we type exit and the install progresses this will just uh right now it's verifying the checksums but then it'll uh extract the files onto that system and we're almost done. Uh, there's one other step. Once you're done the install, uh, when you go mm -hmm. to exit, it asks, would you like to drop into a shell in the new system to do any final configuration? In that one, yep. uh, critically, what we have to do is set the uh, bootloader to load that uh, Go Mirror module mm -hmm. into the kernel, because otherwise uh, our mirror device won't exist. Devices don't show. And then you can't mm -hmm. boot off it, and that will cause you some headache. <laughs> So this will be done in just a second, and we'll be able to do that. Cool. Uh, and then there's also the gmir status command, uh, which will mm -hmm. show you what your mirrors look like. And uh, for example, you know if it's uh, having to resilver or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So you can check the progress of the resilver and, and whatever else you need to do. Right, so now when we choose exit, it says uh, it's now finished. Would you like to open a shell in the new system? We'll say yes. We'll go to slash boot, pull up the loader.conf, and add the line com underscore mirror underscore load equals yes. And if we look at gmir status, we can see our two mirrors and what they consist of. Sweet. So there you exit, go. Exit, let it reboot, and we'll have a working system. Very cool. Maybe at some point, we'll add to tutorial how to replace a failed disk or something. Yep. We need. Uh, that's actually pretty simple in this. It's just a matter of uh, uh, using gmir attach. I mm -hmm. think, uh, and you can just... I think detach the old one, attach the new one. Yep. Uh, and you can... Uh, your mirror doesn't have to be just two disks. You can actually create a mirror of like five disks or something if you want. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, on the Netflix boxes, I know what they did is while each drive uh, is completely separate in a Netflix box for storing the movies, they have like six or eight SSDs in each system. And there's a small partition on each that's mirrored across every SSD uh, that has the operating system. So even if like three of their SSDs fail, uh, the system will still work. Okay, and that's great tutorial this week, Alan. We'll be back in just a moment with our weekly news roundup and, of course, our closing. Stick around. Next up, we want to mention a new sponsor this week. So we're uh, very pleased to welcome Tarsnap to the BSD Now uh, team here. And, of course, this is kind of appropriate considering we just did a tutorial on RAID yes. and whatnot. And while RAID is great, um, we encourage people to use it. What happens if your system burns up yep. or gets stolen or you delete a file yep. and, oh, I need that back? Well, sometimes off-site backup is the way to go. For sure. So, Alan, let us, a little bit know, let us know a little bit here about what Tarsnap will do for yeah. us. Yeah. Uh, so, as we said, RAID is not backup. You need a backup. And, mm -hmm. you know, many people in BSD are, are security conscious. And so you need backup where you can trust it. And so that's where uh, Tarsnap comes in. Uh, it's written by the uh, former FreeBSD security officer. And basically what it does is you 
uh, use the syntax that uses libarchive, which is what tar is based on, and basically makes a tarball of all the files you want to back up, encrypts it on your system with a key that only you have, uh, and then sends it over to the tarsnap servers at Amazon. Uh, and then when you go to do the same thing the next day or the next hour or whatever frequency you take your backups, it deduplicates and only uh, sends the files that have changed or the bits mm -hmm. of the files that have changed. And that way you don't upload more than you need to, making this great sure. for a laptop even when you're on the road and you're backing up over hotel Wi-Fi or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, if all you're backing up is the code you wrote today, that's not that much data, but it's really important data. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And so, yes, uh, Tarsnap is great. Uh, there's no minimum cost. Uh, it's just uh, 25 cents per gigabyte per month that you leave stored there and 25 cents per gigabyte for bandwidth uh, that you uh, send and receive. And uh, mm -hmm. there's no minimum price. It's all pay as you go. So you put money in your account and you back up your files until you run out of money and then you put more money in your account. <laughs> uh, the typical uh, Tarsnap user spends less than $10 a month backing up all their nice. files. And of course, so how does the key management work on that, Alan? Uh, you have the key, whatnot? and so uh, Colin's written a couple articles. Interestingly, it's like you know where uh, one company accidentally leaks somebody's files or whatever, and Colin's like, "Well, see, rather than promising that I won't do that, I made it technically mm -hmm. impossible for me to do that." <laughs> right. So smart way to go. Uh, so because everything's encrypted on your machine before it ever goes to Colin, Colin has no way to tell what your files are let alone have access mm -hmm. to them. And uh, because of that, that means even under a subpoena, he can't give your files away. Sure. And, or uh, give anyone access to anything because it's all encrypted on your system before it leaves. And so it's a private backup. Yes. Nobody else can see it. Exactly. This is not Dropbox, folks. Yeah. Uh, so the disadvantage is you don't get to deduplicate your files with other people's files. But mm -hmm. that's a trade-off you definitely want to make. Uh, and yes, the other yes. great thing is that the client... Uh, the source code is open for you to view, so you can actually audit the source code and compile the client yourself so that you know that exactly uh, what's running on your system, mm -hmm. which is not That's something right. any other backup provider likes to give you. Cool. Yep. So well, if you of go course, to, we uh, need to mention yeah, if, uh, yeah, the web address. Yeah, tarsnap.com slash BSD now and sign up. Uh, that'll let, uh, let them know you uh, take your backup seriously and you came from BSD now. Because you know, everybody thinks they should back up their stuff, but not everybody does. And then now it's so easy, there's no reason for you not to be backing up your stuff all the time. Well, you know what they say, there's two types of people in the world, yeah. those who've lost data and those who are going to. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, let's, uh, let's be somebody who's a little smart about this exactly. and <laughs> gets our backups done ahead of time. Exactly. Well, cool. Thanks, Alan. We hope you guys check out Tarsnap and, uh, of course, let them know we sent you. So next up, we're going to push into the weekly news roundup, yep. quickly go through some of the other notables from the last week. So, so first up, BSD Talk episode 240. Wow. Yeah, they're that way ahead like of us, lot. aren't they? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're catching up. Well, yep. we're, we're gunning for you. Yep. <laughs> but, uh, of course, the original BSD bod podcaster, Will Bachman, has uploaded a new episode of BSD Talk, this time with our buddy GNN as the guest, mostly talking about NTP yes, and keeping uh, reliable time. George Neville Neal's favorite topic is time. Uh, he's mm -hmm. one of the only people that has like crazy clock gear at his house. Uh, yep. And uh, it's one of his favorite topics, so it's always great to hear him talk about it. Cool. And they, they got into all kinds of stuff here. Crystals using watches and computers to keep time, how temperature affects quality, different sources of inaccuracy, some general NTP information, why you want extremely precise time, different time sources, differences in stratum levels, the problem of packet delay, estimating round trip time, and some of the recent NTP amplification attacks, and of course the downsides to using UDP instead of TCP, and much more. So if you are a time nut or interested in any of these things, you'll definitely want to check it out. Yep. And he also talks a little bit, I guess, about the precision time protocol and how it's a little different than NTP. Yeah, and how it's used for different things and with different goals. So if you listen to this, you'll probably recognize the voices because we've had both these folks on yes. um, on the show in past episodes. But it's a, a really great uh, interview, and you should definitely check it out. Mm -hmm. Cool. And, of course, um, we'll have a link on our website to the previous tutorial we did on NTP. So if that's something you're interested in figuring out how to use, yes. how to configure, go ahead and check out that uh, tutorial. Yeah, for sure. Okay, next up, we have a uh, trip report from a uh, OpenBSD hackathon in Morocco. Yes. So I guess, uh, who wrote about this, Alan? Um, I'm not sure who wrote about it, but this is uh, Jasper uh, Andreessen. I, I can't pronounce that. Anyway, uh, he uh, 
arrived in Morocco and uh, worked on a bunch of stuff. He uh, imp uh, improved support for Puppet, uh, the, man the cloud management system on OpenBSD. Uh, so that was really interesting. Uh, and also mm -hmm. uh, worked on some bugs with their package system so that if you have ensure latest in a package, it'll actually uh, update the packages on OpenBSD. Sure. And they uh, moved their entire stack to use Ruby 2.0 instead of 1.9. Nice. Uh, and they also did a bunch of other work, uh, including some changes for, I guess, Erlang, Spice Stack, uh, Service Spec, mm -hmm. and a bunch of other stuff. So I mentioned here are some GNOME-related patches and uh, fixing some ports compatibility with LibreSSL. Oh, nice. So that's... That is cool as well. I also have a awesome. separate so have article to... on uh, LibreSSL. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Yeah, a couple of the other things you mentioned there about Puppet, Port, etc. Yeah. So definitely cool. Okay. Well, next up, why should you use FreeBSD on your cloud VPS? So we have a cool blog post from Atlantic, a VPS and hosting provider, about 10 reasons for using FreeBSD. It starts off with a little bit of BSD history for those who are unfamiliar with it and only maybe know the background of Linux and Windows. And a uh, spoiler, the 10 reasons they give are community, stability, collaboration, ease of use, port, security, ZFS, GOM, sound, and having lots of options. So that's really cool. The yeah. post goes into detail about each of them and why FreeBSD makes a great choice for a VPS OS. Yeah, so, guess. of course, hit up the link. Yeah, they have for that. a good paragraph on each of those different reasons and why it's important. Uh, mm -hmm. And yeah, that, there's a reason why uh, all like 100 or so of my servers all run FreeBSD. For sure. It's, it's mostly those 10 reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay, and last but not least, of course, we have our weekly PCBSD Weekly Digest. So this last week we had a blog post uh, kind of rounding up some of the things we've been working on the last couple weeks. But the biggest change is that the PBI system, App Cafe, and all related tools are getting merged into one single tool mm -hmm. that all use PackageNG as the back end now. Nice. So uh, App Cafe is no longer going to be limited to PBIs. It's going to become the one-stop shop for everything that's available via packages. So nice. if you go in there, you'll be able to say, I want KDE, I want GNOME, I want VirtualBox, I want anything that may not have been in a PBI format before will now be available in one location. It's even gotten pretty advanced to where you can do things like package locking mm -hmm. now graphically. And uh, yeah, and it even does jail management. So nice. if you have running jails on the system, you can browse for your app. We'll say it's Nginx. And then when you click install, hit the little down arrow on the right and say, by the way, install that into this jail. Nice. And then uh, on the browse page, you can pick which jail you want to view and, and view what's installed on them and then do updates, etc. So it's going to be really cool. Yeah. We're basically taking three or four separate apps and combining them all into one that just does everything. That's awesome. So, yeah, and it's even got some cool new features for usability, including ratings. So people will be able to uh, give one out of five star ratings on applications and then uh, community pages for each application as well where we'll be posting tips and tricks and it's on our wiki so you can edit it and contribute your own uh, bits of wisdom or experiences with different applications and we're hoping to make that a, a useful place. You know, For example, for Firefox, instead of having to Google to figure out how to fix a quirk or something on FreeBSD's version of Firefox, you can just hit the community button and hopefully it's right there. Nice. So yeah, a lot of lot of fun stuff happening in PCBSD world, and we hope to show off a few a little bit of this in the upcoming weeks when we push out our next edge package set. Nice. Cool. So we'll be back in just a moment with our uh, feedback and questions for the week. And we're back for our weekly feedback and roundup. So first up, we have a question from Martin this week about FreeNAS. So what's he got going on, Alan? Uh, this is uh, Martin had uh, asked us uh, quite a few episodes ago uh, about a problem he was having with his FreeNAS and the fact that his uh, girlfriend's name has an accent in it and uh, creating mm -hmm. that in FreeNAS was causing him issues. Uh, so he said, I had requested an update later on and he wrote in and he says uh, he, he did change her name. <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> uh, and... Uh, Reset up her laptop with a different username that didn't have the accented character, and the problem went away. Uh, mm -hmm. So he's having another problem with his FreeNAS server, uh, which he calls DasNAS. <laughs> uh, nice. It says it's going well, and now he's trying to replicate it into a second box called DasBKP, uh, mm -hmm. which is a smaller system. Uh, he set up his snapshots and uh, replication with, on DasNAS, and he's replicating the whole pool, uh, which has a bunch of different data sets on it. Mm hmm and he says, so uh, DasNAS is set up uh, to be replicated in all of its data sets. The data set public got replicated fine. 
uh, but everything else has not been replicated. Uh, the datasets hierarchy has been created by the replication process, but no snapshots in some of the uh, different datasets are replicated. He said he tried to activate the initialized remote side, and it did the same thing. Uh, only mm -hmm. the public data set had its snapshots copied. Um, that's kind of something hard to debug remotely, uh, but it'd be interesting to see the output of uh, like ZFS space list uh, minus T snapshots on both. So you can see the list of snapshots on the one side and the other side and see what happens. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I'm, the, Freenas keeps uh, logs of the replication somewhere. I imagine that might uh, have some error messages or something. Sure. Uh, but he says, uh, both of the machines are two terabyte pools. Uh, the, the main NAS is uh, mirrored, but the backup is just single drive. Uh, the main NAS is 64-bit, and the backup is only 32-bit. And the mm -hmm. main NAS is connected to the network at a gigabit, and the backup only at 100 megabits. But uh, all that should be fine. Uh, so yeah, it can depend. I don't, I, I've not done the replication of FreeNAS to know if you can like mark it recursive or if you have to create separate replication for each parent data set or which. You should be able to do recursive. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, it'll be if you could uh, mail us with the ZFS list minus T snapshot on uh, from the both the DAS NAS and DAS backup, uh, then maybe that will shed some light on what's happening there. Cool. And he says uh, he hasn't tested PCBSD 10 yet, uh, but he's got a laptop that he's not using anymore, and he's going to try it out. Sweet. So we'd okay. also like Let to us hear. Uh, yeah, we'd like to hear what you your experience with that is as well. Cool. Okay, well, next up, we have something from John here about learning BSD. So he writes in, says he's a computer scientist student at, West, at Missouri Western, and two years ago, his advisor told him to install Linux and give it a try. He says he took the Linux like cows to a pasture in spring. I suppose that means you liked it. So uh, you've installed Arch, Fedora, Ubuntu, Linux Mint, Debian, Tails, Elementary O's, just to name a few. He says he's watched Linux Action Show, Linux Unplugged, and te TechSnap since December. He's also found the BSD show we're doing and has watched a few of them recently. So his advisor challenged him to install BSD this summer and write an essay on findings on it. So his question is, which BSD should I use to learn BSD and challenge myself to learn the differences between Linux and BSD besides just their licenses? So thanks for the great show and info. Well, you know what I'm going to recommend, John? I mean, if you're used to graphical installs and having the desktop available out of box, well, go grab a copy of PCBSD, obviously. Yeah, just looking at the distributions that he's used, they definitely seem mm -hmm. desktop-oriented, so I would definitely yes. recommend uh, PCBSD as the place to get started. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, definitely get started that way. If you're ready for a little bit more of a challenge and want to dig into the console installation, then yeah, grab a free BSD or open BSD disk mm -hmm. and boot it up, see what happens. Um, of course, if you were trying to go from that to a desktop, it's going to be probably a little bit more work. But uh, yeah. PCBSD is a good way if you want to get your feet wet, get it installed, and then have all your tools so you can start doing your documentation yeah, on and, it. Yeah, uh, and the basic differences are, you know, your desktop environment, KDE or GNOME or XFCE or whatever, is basically the same. Uh, the mm -hmm. difference comes in the way drivers are set up uh, and mostly the user land tools. Uh, yeah. I think one of the, the way the file system is laid the, out, too, one of the, will be different. Yeah, but obviously. one of the biggest differences I find switching between Linux and BSD is the top command. In FreeBSD, <laughs> the top command is fast and useful. In Linux, mm -hmm. you need to install an alternative top command because the default one is useless and slow. Yep. <laughs> yep. <laughs> like in, in FreeBSD's uh, top, you can be like, top, I want to see disk I.O. instead of CPU usage. Or top, I want sort mm -hmm. it by the amount of memory or the amount of resident memory or the amount of CPU time or whatever column I want to sort by. Uh, sure. And, and yeah, if you just look at the man page for top on FreeBSD and you see the list of options and then you look on Linux and there's like four. And it's mm -hmm. just the, the top command is not very useful. Because <laughs> uh, FreeBSD developers are more curious about what's going on under yes, the hood. And, and, that's always the problem I have when I use the Linux system. Part of it is just that I don't know the Linux as well, but it's just like I don't feel like I can tell what's happening on the system. It's like this system mm -hmm. is slow, and I don't know why. I don't have the gstat command to look at what's going on on the hard drives yeah. and the latencies and stuff, and I don't have a top, and I don't have this and that, and I'm like, ah, where's all my tools? Well, that's where you're going to notice the differences. I mean, once you boot up to the desktop, like Alan said, it's going to be KDE. And, I mean, you can fool people by changing the wallpaper and they'll mess around and think it's Linux. But as soon as you open up a, a console, 
somewhere and start really poking around, you go, ah, okay, I'm getting this now. Yeah. This is a little different. The way files are laid out, the way the kernel is set up. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we still have uh, rc.dscripts and yeah. rc.conf and just a lot of differences underneath the hood. Yeah. But and from a top level looking down, it's going to appear similar at first. One of the other things is you will learn that you never lose files. <laughs> mm -hmm. You never have to wonder, where did that program install that? Because mm -hmm. on BSD, there's rules and all the packages are pounded into shape with a hammer so that every package installs its files to where you would expect to find them. Right? Yep. You install Apache and it's under user local etc Apache. That's right. Well, cool. So go ahead and uh, you know take that for a spin. Let us know how it goes. Yes, we'd love to, to have a, your a, a copy of your essay when it's done as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. Okay. Well, next up, we have something from Alex writing in about an NFS bug, I guess, uh, on FreeBSD here. So what's going on, Alan? Yeah. Uh, so he's having a strange problem with using uh, Git over NFS. Uh, he's He's tried it with uh, OpenBSD 5.5 and NetBSD, and he doesn't have this problem, uh, mm -hmm. although I'm not sure if it was set up quite the same. Uh, so he says he mounts an NFS drive and tries to make a git init somewhere on it, and when he does, mm -hmm. he gets errors about permissions denied. Uh, on the ZFS okay. drive, he creates the files without any permission flags, uh, and when he looks at it, he sees an ls here. It's not mentioning which machine he's creating the stuff on. Hmm, okay. Um, he shows the entry he has on his FS tab. Uh, it's hard to say without seeing the permissions on the NFS server side either, but I noticed some of the files have absolutely no permissions on them at all. That does seem weird. Yeah. I don't know why. That seems like it's most likely a Git bug rather than a uh, NFS bug, but I've never seen that happen on my Git. But yeah, I don't know. It'd be interesting to see the paste from looking at the same LS on one of the machines where it did work, and see if that's mm -hmm. just the difference or what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, I really don't know what to tell. Yeah. Uh, hey, well, of course, we'll we'll post the notes here with the details and everything. So if somebody in the audience is an NFS expert or yes. knows Git really inside and out, could tell us whether this is expected behavior, yep. that would be helpful. And then we can try and answer that yes, question in a future it's, episode. Uh, Alex's problem sorted out. Okay. Uh, but I doubt it's a bug in NFS. That, that seems mm -hmm. unlikely specifically. The problem here seems to be that, uh, well, yeah, the config file here has really strange permissions on it. it uh, mm -hmm. The owner's allowed to execute it but not read it and nothing else. It kind of almost seems like a UMask is messed up, but sure. all the other files look fine except for the ones that have no permissions at all. Mm -hmm. That's just really strange. <laughs> Definitely. Yes, you should be getting that error because the permissions on that file say that you're not allowed to read that file. Mm-hmm. Okay, well, we'll, uh, we'll move on. Hopefully, yep. we'll get an answer for you in a future episode. So next up, a um, fellow writing in here, questions about TrueOS and uh, Jelly. So he said he had posted something to the PCBSD forums about doing some TrueOS stuff. He said he didn't get a reply there. So first of all, a lot of the server guys don't hang out on forums. They're going to be on the mailing yep. list. So that would be a better place to post server-related questions. Um, he said he knows that PCBSD supports individual encrypted home directories, which we do. That's what we use on with a PEFS. He said that's not practical for him on his server. So he wants to do installation, as you do on FreeBSD, on top of an encrypted Jelly drive. He said he tried to mirror it that as good as possible. He said now he's got a working TrueOS install with a mirrored ZPool on top of two Jelly disks. So that's good. He says, but here's the rub. He wants to get boot environments and Grub working with that. So he's manually written a working grub.cfg, but it only works for this one installation. Despite the fact that in the FreeBSD installer, it claims just to configure the vpool with working BEDM, this does not seem to be the case. BEDM completely ignores the unencrypted pool or the fact that boot and the kernel are not on the same volume. So he's asking if anyone has solved this problem or at least a hint. So um, first of all, that's why we don't support it yet. Um, yeah. It's going to be a little bit more work than just doing the installation, which we can do to Jelly at this point. 
but you lose the boot environment support. The boot environment command expects everything to be on a single pool, and it's going to require some hacking to hack in you know, support for having an unencrypted boot pool and an encrypted root. Now, it's on our list to do. I've, I've done some looking into the BEDM code, and we can probably do it. It's just not going to be until a future release, probably 10.1 a little later in the year yeah. was our uh, timetable for it. But uh, once that's supported, then BEDM will do all the proper bits to make Grub work and to uh, work with the secondary pool, snapshotting it alongside your encrypted pool. Because that's the key. you got to make sure the snapshots are done the same time or as close as possible yeah. between the two. Yeah, and, sadly, uh, there's, it's doable. there's really, you know, ideally it would all happen on one pool, but the, you, you can't really do that. So, Yeah, yeah, it just doesn't work quite that way at the moment, so... Again, that's something that's on our list to do, and we'll, I'll probably be the one doing it unless some FreeBSD user gets ambitious and decides to add support to it um, before I can get to it, which would be great. In that case, we'll update our installer to do that yeah. out of box. But uh, in the meantime, that's why I'd it's like not I'd like to see supported. the mainline version of B Adam actually get um, run what's in the development version. Like the, the, the one that's oh. under, like, uh, SysUtils Beatem is, is quite old. It's the mm -hmm. one that doesn't support... Uh, if your pool is called something else, custom pool names, yeah. yeah. Uh, whereas the yeah. um, the development version does. It's just the nobody seems to release it ever. Uh, but well, we'll we'll see if we yeah. can bug the port maintainer. Maybe a BSD can yeah. if he's there to uh, to bump that back into the non develop version. Yeah, we're running the develop because yes, of that because exactly. it's it's helpful to have those features. Well, and because um, I hate having that one data set that's all uppercase. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So somebody else had written me earlier in the week, and uh, I guess nobody's maintaining the Grub2 port anymore, so I may grab that okay. and port over all of our custom fixes we've done to make Grub support boot environments on PCBSD. Uh -huh, cool. That'd be kind of cool if we can get that into the FreeBSD version as well. Yes, and then have but, uh, that by proxy get into Grub2-Beehive? Yeah, because, yeah uh, that may. Because we got, uh, you can boot root on ZFS in a Beehive now. That's working, mm -hmm. so... Mm -hmm. uh, getting that working with... Well, I guess when you're rooting FreeBSD, you don't use Grub, so I guess it doesn't matter. No, no. But matter the advantage, case, but, uh, uh, eventually, having boot environments in a virtual machine could be really cool. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. I mean, yeah. <laughs> There's no reason not to. Yeah. So, uh, cool. But anyway, I hope that answers your question. Like I said, hit the mailing list up if you want to discuss server stuff. That's where more server folks are going to hang out. And we'll uh, hopefully get something working with that a little later this year and uh, have that in a future release as a new feature. Mm -hmm. Cool. So next up, we have a question from, let's see, Jared. Yes. So he says, uh, about docs. when he first began using FreeBSD about a year ago, uh, the most challenging thing he faced was getting around in the documentation and getting help with issues when he encountered them. Uh, and he says mm -hmm. he still has a bit of trouble with that today. And he was wondering, might we consider a tutorial uh, on effectively using the various forms of documentation and support? Uh, so he says, you know, um, the FreeBSD handbook, uh, we mentioned a lot, but maybe not everybody knows about it and what it is. Basically, it's uh, designed as a book. It's actually going to get printed later this year, in, and you'll mm -hmm. be able to buy it in a two-book set. Uh, and you should basically use it for anything that's specific to FreeBSD. Uh, it's like 30-some-odd chapters, I think. Uh, nice. And it's basically got a section on anything that's included in the base system, whether it's mm -hmm. how to set up mirrored disks like we did in our tutorial this week, or if it's you know uh, how to run Beehive, uh, that the changes to the handbook to uh, I wrote a section on how to run FreeBSD and Linux in Beehive, and that w went into the handbook earlier this week. Uh, mm -hmm. And then he says, what doesn't it cover? Mostly, it doesn't cover anything you would have to install from the package system, uh, which is ports sure. or package ng. So if it's from there, they might mention that you can install this package to do that, but it won't provide much specific help on anything that's not part of FreeBSD. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the man pages, uh, those are when you need more detail about a specific command. Unlike Linux man pages, the FreeBSD man pages often include examples and more explanation. It's not just here are the flags for the command and that's it. Uh, like if you read the IPFW man page, it goes in extensive detail with examples and all the different features and explanation. And even the man page for like Netcat has examples on how to do the different stuff and when you would use the different flags and what they mean and so on. Cool. Uh, the man pages are uh, installed by default on FreeBSD. Yeah. They're also available on the, on the website. The advantage to the website is, A, you can look at different versions of them, but also just mm -hmm. sometimes it's easier to read them on the website. 
Uh, and it's also just to search them in, or do whatever you want to do. So they're just easier okay. to read that way. Uh, or you can read them on a system, uh, on one system like your laptop while you're fixing another system. You know, being able to split screen or uh, have two screens, one with the main page and one with what you're doing instead of having to try to flip back and forth can also be useful. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, they cover any command that's built into the operating system has a main page. And most sure. of the functionality and features and drivers also have one as well. Like there's uh, a man page for like the Intel network card driver that explains which devices are supported by it. What are the features? You know, what are the different uh, things you can turn on and off and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And then he talks about package documentation. Most things you install from ports install man pages uh, if they have one. And so you can read that. And some of them also include documentation or examples that will go under user local somewhere. Uh, usually the port will tell you about that. Sure. Um, oh, cool. Uh, also, an uh, interesting place to look is uh, Fresh Ports. It, it makes it easy to search the mm -hmm. ports tree and has a lot of information, including the recent commit history, so you can tell how recently a port's been updated and you know what the message for the update was might explain. You know, If you're using a port and it's not working, you look at Fresh Ports and see, oh, there's a newer version, and in the mm -hmm. commit message, it explains that it fixes the problem I'm having, so I'm going <laughs> to upgrade to that. And so on. Yeah, I kind of live in fresh ports. Yes. I always have a tab open to that. Yeah. Uh, and then he also mentions uh, how to interact with a mailing list. We just did a tutorial on that. You may have uh, written this in before you saw that. So you should check out mm -hmm. our tutorial on the mailing list. And uh, the FreeBSD forums are very useful, uh, especially if you're, you know, uh, we found that certain younger people tend to prefer forums over mailing lists. Uh, and so a number of people have made an effort to make sure that there are experts on the forums available to answer questions. And uh, mm -hmm. there's a couple people on there that, in uh, unlike a lot of other forums, they go through and curate the answers people give. And uh, they have uh, basically a consistent formatting with the way we format the handbook so that when you find on the forum somebody's answer, it's been cleaned up such that you can actually uh, use it. So when you find a, a, forum, a result from the FreeBSD forum on Google a year from now, it actually still, it's easy to tell what, what the answer is and and what to do sure and specifically the markup for you know this is a file name and this is device name and this is a link to this and whatever and uh he goes on to ask you know when's a question worth asking pretty much you can always ask the question uh but it's best to uh even if you ask the question on irc and get the answer it's often helpful to post the question and the answer on the forums so if someone else has the same problem and they google for it they'll find your forum post and your answer and mm -hmm. that's the other thing. Even if you post on the forums, if you eventually find the answer, if you go back and post that, that'll help the next person a lot. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah. Well, cool. Good answer on that. He had a long Thanks. question. Oh, he also there, asked uh, about the official IRC channels. Uh, for FreeBSD, mm -hmm. it's pound FreeBSD on Freenode. Although there's also cool. uh, uh, numerous ones on uh, Fnet and so on. And I think the pound OpenBSD on Freenode is their official one as well. Okay. Uh, and he says, is there any way around time zone differences? Uh, the FreeBSD community is pretty global, so there's usually people on in every time zone. And a lot of people don't live in their time zone, if you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Often people stay up <laughs> later than they should. Yes. Uh, and so on. We're a community of all types. And that's the other thing, is in addition to the handbook, there's also a developer's handbook and a porter's handbook for FreeBSD mm -hmm. that actually get into stuff you need to know as a developer or stuff you need to know if you're porting applications to FreeBSD. Uh, and I think there's one for hardware porting as well. There are quite a few different books uh, in the FreeBSD documentation set. Mm -hmm. And there's also a big FAQ, uh, which is often oh, updated yes. and uh, very useful when you just need the answer right away. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, and okay. so, yeah, that should uh, do it. Cool. Excellent. Well, thank you guys for sticking with us for the show today. Of course, we want to mention our tutorials are going to be posted in their entirety at bsdnow.tv. So go ahead and check that out if there's something you want to set up. Yep. Odds are we may have done a tutorial on it already. Yes. So take a look. And, uh, the interesting thing is that those tutorials are basically living tutorials. They keep getting updated. Mm -hmm. uh, the Tor and the mailing list tutorial, which we just mentioned, uh, just got a bunch of fixes and updates. And the OpenBSD router tutorial has been... Uh, upgraded and set up for the new OpenBSD 5.5 .5 with Signify. Uh, so that nice. it's, it's instead of being about 5.4, it's now about 5.5. .5. So when you find that, when you're going to use that tutorial, it'll now be a fresh system instead of an old one. Mm -hmm. Very cool. 
So, of course, you can send your questions, comments, show ideas, topics, or maybe a story you want mentioned on the show to feedback at bscnow.tv. We will monitor that email. That's the only place to send it, so don't yep. ping us on YouTube or Reddit or anywhere else. We're not going to see those. Yep. Of course, if you've got something cool to talk about and maybe you want to come on the show for an interview, shoot us an email. Sure. Let us know. We'll try and schedule you in. Yep. And uh, if any listeners have a collection of old FreeBSD or OpenBSD CDs, we'd love for you to send in a picture so we can show kind of a whole set together and show it off on the show. That would be pretty cool. I know, I know Jordan has a lot of old FreeBSD CDs. Yeah. He used to There's be in a number charge. of guys. Well, have. yeah, but Jordan used to be in charge of making the original FreeBSD CDs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that's cool. So, Jordan, if you're listening or any other folks who still have those sets of CDs, yes. send us a pic. We'd love to feature it on a future episode. Exactly. And, of course, you can watch us live Wednesdays at 2 p.m. Eastern, 1800 UTC, and see how we make the show, all the yep. bits that got edited out, yep. maybe by the time you saw it later in the week. And uh, we'll mention, as we did at the opening, we're going to be at BSD Can next week. So if you're planning on being there, come by and say hi. Yep. Introduce yourself. We'd love to talk to you and uh, you know, get your feedback about the show. Yep. Uh, but we'll still have an awesome episode next week. We're actually we will. doing, uh, when I was at Asia BSD Con at Developer Summit, I managed to uh, mm -hmm. uh, get uh, Matt Aarons to let us record what he was saying when he was talking about ZFS. Mm -hmm. So we have almost two hours of the best ZFS information you're going to get on yes. everything that's been done over the last six months and everything that's going to happen over the next six months. Yeah. One of the developers talking about it. I mean, yeah. it doesn't get any any fresher and better than yeah. that. It's, it's all great information. Uh, sadly, I don't have the couple of things he drew on the chalkboard, but they're pretty simple anyway. Uh, okay. But he gives great explanation and answers some really good questions from me and a bunch of other people in the developer summit. Cool. Okay, well, again, if you're going to be there next week, look forward to seeing you. Otherwise, stick around, enjoy the show next week, and we'll be back in a couple weeks with a, another live episode. Thanks.